Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about uh, distributed computing and uh, what we're doing at uh, King's uh, uh, at, at uh, King's Distributed Systems. Um, what we're building is uh, an easy to use, really compelling um, distributed compute system. Uh, so, like every distributed computing system, uh, what DCP allows us to do is to um, essentially express uh, a, a parallelizable workload in a way that it can be computed. Um, so the way we're currently expressing these workloads is um, that we have uh, a nice, easy to use um, uh, API that lets uh, JavaScript developers uh, express work. Uh, so what they do is they we have a function call and uh, uh, we call it uh, compute.4. And it's very much like a traditional for loop uh, except that in, instead of computing uh, the, the work function uh, in series, um, like we do with a, a for loop, like a decompiler, um, we compute um, the, in, in parallel. So what users do is they express an input set, um, which can be any uh, iterable or numerable uh, object in JavaScript uh, with some caveats, uh, an input function, um, and some arguments to the input function. We put those together and we call that a job handle. And then you run the job handle just with job handle.exec. Um, and it produces for you an output set. Uh, so that is very core is how we do um, uh, parallel computation with DCP. Uh, right now, we're focused uh, predominantly on perfectly parallel problems um, because we understand that we have to walk before we run and we have to solve um, uh, you know, the, the little hanging fruit problems before we get into the really interesting problems. Although we do have uh, one of our internal research groups actually um, looking at some uh, coarse screen parallelism problems right now with computational fluid dynamics. Um, so this is it's a pretty high level description, uh, but What's actually really key is not that we're doing parallel compute, because that's been done before. Uh, and it's not that we're doing uh, parallel compute with uh, shared computers, because that's been done before. So we, we, we look at projects like, for example, uh, I remember even in the early 90s, uh, we had SETI at home, um, where the SETI group um, was having all of these home computers all over the internet uh, analyze radio telescope data. Uh, looking for uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, and so that particular concept itself isn't new. What's new is that we've turned around and we've put it together um, in a, a, a usable, uh, compelling way, and we've figured out how to uh, uh, get it to a marketplace, get users to it, uh, and make it available. So we've chosen as our stack for... Uh, our, our parallel compute work functions uh, to be the web stack. Uh, the web stack is undeniably uh, probably the most important uh, um, uh, emerged slash emerging uh, software development stack in the world today. Uh, if you took a poll of an arbitrary group of developers that you found somewhere on the street, I guarantee you at least half of them would have significant expertise uh, inner operating with the web stack. Uh, it's you know, the way the world is moving. Um, uh, you know, we have all kinds of web apps uh, today that, you know, dramatically outstrip in terms of capabilities, uh, full on install applications from less than a decade ago. Uh, we have even, you know, chunks of Photoshop written as web app. Actually, there's a Photoshop clone that's a web app. We have our Google Docs and and a lot of applications are actually web apps in the back end right now because they're convenient to develop that way and it allows uh, the software companies to develop portable units where they say, okay, this stuff goes in our web version, this goes in our desktop version, or it's the web version with special stuff on it, and so on and so forth. But the web stack is really interesting. It's a very special stack. Um, we're achieving something with the web stack that we've tried to achieve um, a few times in the past, and that's the... Uh, uh, it's the dream of every software developer, especially software development team manager, which is right once run everywhere. Uh, uh, the web stack is uh, uh, 
in some ways, uh, much better than Java in terms of uh, software portability. So you can write a, a web application like Gmail, and you can reasonably expect that web application to run mm. on Windows, on Linux, on Mac OS, on iOS, on Android, and on whatever operating system merges in the next five years, you know that the software you're running today will run on it because everybody is building uh, a really good implementation of the web platform. The other interesting thing is uh, the development of the JavaScript language itself. So JavaScript, because it's the lingua franca of the web stack, started to have a lot of research money poured into it um, uh, about 13, 14 years ago is really when things really, really started to change. Um, and uh, a lot of these changes, you know, they've taken time to, to propagate down to the end user, but that, that's when it started. And what people started understanding then was that the, the web stack, in particular JavaScript, is also a good compilation target. Uh, and it also needs to be fast. So what we started seeing starting in 2000 and a 2010, uh, we had Google, Apple, uh, Microsoft, and Mozilla pouring billions and billions of dollars into trying to figure out how to make JavaScript really fast and really memory efficient and really secure. Uh, and all those things are really important to what we're doing at, down, down at King's. Uh, so we actually get to leverage uh, all of their work. Uh, uh, JavaScript right now, I haven't, I haven't done a formal study, but I, I'm pretty confident in the statement that it is the fastest interpreted language, period, the end, bar none. Um, the JIT that's available in it is uh, is absolutely fantastic. Another thing that we get out of that uh, back end uh, that is useful for the work that Kings is doing is absolute uh, uh, portability uh, with respect to um, uh, mathematics. Uh, so if you take uh, a given complex calculation and you run it on a power PC and you run it on a Spark and you run it on an AMD chip and you run it on an Intel chip and you run it on an ARM chip, you don't actually get different answers. Um, and there's very good reasons for that and it essentially has to do with um, uh, how certain mathematical approximations are made, even on chips that use the same underlying floating point representation. And uh, when we're looking at doing uh, scientific compute uh, across platforms, we actually need consistent results across platforms because that's one of the ways that we can use to make sure uh, that the work that is being done is being done correctly. So uh, if you look at, uh, for example, uh, one of our sort of competitors, and I say sort of competitors because they are trying to build ad hoc compute networks uh, but that's kind of it. Uh, uh, what's it called? Boink. Uh, so one of the problems with, with Boink is that they run native applications uh, on uh, the computers that do the work. Uh, and the native applications do give these different answers uh, because of the, uh, the, you know, the vagarities of uh, the different compilers that they have and the different chips that they're running on. Uh, and a lot of their scientific applications, when they do their results verification, they accept up to a 10% margin of error uh, in the results to, to know whether it's probably the same answer or not. And uh, from my point of view, that's completely insane. Uh, I want bitwise identical results for the same inputs. End of story. Um, and the way that we're leveraging and carefully using the JavaScript ecosystem um, we're able to achieve those things. So we have consistent math libraries, and we have consistent uh, floating point representation, um, and uh, we've carefully instantiated the environments to allow us to have a lot uh, less entropy when that's what's desired uh, uh, for these things. Uh, and so, so other benefits that we get from that same uh, ecosystem uh, our uh, security and again more speed. Uh, you've probably heard of WebAssembly. Uh, I won't talk much about WebAssembly other than to say it's sort of a JavaScript subset that's even faster and more portable um, and can be used as a compilation target for other programming languages today with off-the-shelf toolkits that we don't have to write and maintain. Uh, so that's one of the things that we do really well at Kings is we leverage our strengths 
uh, in terms of building our distributed compute infrastructure, but uh, we're able to, uh, you know, take advantage of uh, both uh, what has been uh, developed uh, in industry with these large companies and also within uh, uh, the communities like the, the Node NPM community, which is, I think, probably the largest uh, uh, developer community and fastest growing developer community in the world right now, which is why Microsoft uh, just uh, threw a lot of money at them uh, about 10 or 11 months ago uh, to, to buy their way into that ecosystem. Microsoft knows just how valuable that is. Um, so uh, it's kind of a long, long way of talking about all these things. So what's interesting is that uh, what our competitors can't do is they can't get arbitrary workload and they can't run it arbitrary places. Uh, so not only do they have uh, the problems with uh, you know, some of these technical issues that I talked about, they also have social issues. Uh, so one of the social issues that they have is um, you want to run native code on my machine? Are you nuts? I better know where this native code comes from. That's a completely leg legitimate security concern. Um, another one is um, uh, uh, they've got some orchestration problems and whatnot. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to those in a minute. Um, but um, we're not running native code. Uh, we're running interpreted code, which allows us to build some really good secure sandboxes, uh, which means that I, as a compute provider that wants to maybe earn some credits with my computer, uh, can do that and have a reasonably good guarantee that the workload that gets sent to me is not going to harm my computer. Now, how good is that guarantee? If you trust your computer to run a web browser and go to a website that you don't know the author of, that's exactly the same security profile that we're uh, presenting uh, providers of compute with uh, today because we're actually leveraging that same browser security model, uh, the same uh, and, the, and the actual same code uh, to do that. We use either the web browser itself or we use the JavaScript engine out of Google called V8 uh, to actually execute that code. And because we're doing that and because we can have this trustworthy environment, not only can people come on board and say, hey, I feel confident running code because I'm already confident running JavaScript code. I do it all the time. I do it every day when I surf the web. I click on sites in Google that I go to and it runs JavaScript. Um, there's a whole other network effect that starts to happen as soon as you can do that. So that means that I don't need to have some kind of special arrangement with the people that are running the compute in order for me to get my workload on the network. So uh, if I want to run a, you know, a thousand core parallel job without DCP, that's a hard problem for me to solve as a, as a person before I joined this company. Um, you know, I would have to turn around and find a thousand cores somewhere uh, because orchestration up and running, I'd probably have to rent some space in the US, blah, 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 blah. Then get my code out there, execute and get the results, get that all. And that actually winds up being the small part. You know, the, the big part is where the heck am I going to get a thousand cores from? Uh, and with Kings, that's actually, it's a solved problem. We're bringing the cores to the people and the people to the cores. And that sort of helps to get the whole wheel moving around. And because I can write whatever job I want and not have to get it passed through, you know, a, a gatekeeper, it means I can actually have a nice quick iterative development process and so on and so forth. So uh, what are we doing that's different than, for example, uh, automatic orchestration with AWS? And it's a question that we get asked a lot. Um, it probably frustrates Dan, maybe more than me, because Dan's on the business end of these, getting these questions all the time, whereas I'm mostly uh, talking tech and APIs and, and uh, you know, uh, visions about where I want our package streams to go on and so forth down the road. Um, uh, but for, for me, the question is a little bit frustrating because it's hard sometimes to get people to see exactly where the big vision is on this. So uh, we look at AWS and it's really it's a completely different thing than what we're doing. Um, and I bet you uh, it's crossed uh, the minds of almost every single person I've been on the phone with in a call like this. And my goal is to try and help people to think beyond that and, and to the next step uh, by the time these calls are over with. Uh, so, AWS. Let's let's talk about AWS because it you know it is the elephant in the room. Uh, AWS is somebody else's computer. That's it. 
Uh, they've got some tools, but that's it. It's somebody else's computer. So uh, I've been computing in one way or another since 1982. Lots of stuff has changed since 1982. But you know what? First it was my computer, then it was somebody else's computer, then it was my computer, then it was somebody else's computer, then it was my computer, then it was somebody else's computer, and it's an endless cycle. Um, it's never really changed. There hasn't been any real innovation in that. It's all been, you know, Google's managed to do, or AWS managed to do it at scale. Uh, frankly, it's really not that much different than when I went to university in, you know, 1992, and it was a hardwired terminal connected to a mainframe. Really, it's really not that different, what they're doing. They've just got some nice tools around it and lots of it. What we're doing is totally different. Uh, we're not doing somebody else's computer. We've uh, taken that whole computer concept, say, okay, you have, you have a computer and you have to have a thin client or a thick client or a medium client, or, and, and we've turned that on its end. What we're doing is we're talking now about moving compute around as opposed to computers. Um, and I'm hoping that this winds up being you know, a fundamental evolutionary step in how we think um, about uh, distributed computing and computing in general uh, in the future. Uh, you know, one of my profs, uh, said something to me 30 years ago that stuck with me. He said, uh, uh, there has been no, he said, there has been uh, no fundamental new inventions in the field of computer science since object-oriented programming. Uh, and it's kind of true. You know, everything we're doing is bigger, better, more parallel, blah, 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 blah. But uh, uh, we still tend to think about computers very much the same way that we did 35 years ago. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know how many of you watch Star Trek. I watch a lot of Star Trek. At least I used to before I got so busy with this company. <laughs> what, what they do with Star Trek is they actually move uh, stuff around. and They move energy around. They move compute around. You know, when the captain needs more compute power for, you know, his deflector dish, he can move it from the astrophysics lab. It magically just happens. I'd like that to happen in our world today. Uh, and, you know, another one of my uh, uh, people that I look up to is, is Bruce Lee. And Bruce Lee is a, you know, we all know him as an actor and a, a very good martial artist. But to me, Bruce Lee is a philosopher. Um, and one of the things he used to say was, uh, uh, you must be like water. People think that that means that you must be fluid. But uh, he then goes on to say, you know, when water enters the cup, it becomes the cup. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and for me, that's kind of, it's a little bit kind of my foundational vision for how I think uh, distributed compute needs to work, and especially the compute marketplace that we have on the go. Uh, what I what I want to have, uh, uh, what I want to do is use all the compute that's available, where it's available, how it's available, and have the orchestration figure out how to run the workload on that compute on that compute wherever and whenever it may be. So imagine you know you're a large company and you need to run quantitative analysis. Uh, you need real compute to do that. You might not need your quants run today. You might need them run by first thing tomorrow morning. Uh, now, the question becomes, where are you going to get that compute? You could get that compute and provision it at AWS. Uh, you could have a big data center. So, you know, we're still answering questions. Where is the computer? Is it my computer? Is it your computer? Is it here? Is it there? But wouldn't it be really great if after hours, you know, those uh, uh, all the machines on your shop floor, uh, your reception areas, your trading floor, whatever you've got on the go, uh, their screensavers just kicked in and did your quantitative analysis for you overnight while the computer sat otherwise idle. Well, you've paid for those computers. You might as well be using them all the time. You know, a computer that's in use eight hours a day is idle 66% of the time. Um, and it can be used for doing work. So what we're trying to do is shuffle that compute around to where it needs, you know, to where it's available and handle all that orchestration and, and put it back together uh, again. Um, and I, I think that's it from a really, you know, a high level point of view. So what we're doing is we're taking compute, we're breaking it down into its constituent components. We're using a good, secure way of doing this so that we can provision it easily. We're handling complex provisioning problems, um, and we're handling uh, the supply of compute itself in a novel way uh, where we believe there's some really big uh, both economic and social value uh, and that's really you know uh, what King's is about on 
uh, on that perspective. And in terms of uh, API, you know, this is one of those things uh, that it's really hard to tell business guys about. Uh, API is really, really important. Um, I was involved with uh, uh, CommonJS. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of CommonJS. It's the uh, specification that is, is a fundamental to Node.js. Node.js is the big server-side JavaScript thing that everybody is using these days. Um, I was involved with the working group that actually created that. Uh, uh, so if you've typed require, I voted for it. Uh, uh, and uh, that was a, uh, uh, we, we originally started that project uh, to allow us to build server-side uh, JavaScript engines. I had been interested in those for a very long time. Um, and the specification came out of that and, and, and so on and so forth. And API came out of that. and. A lot of computer guys will tell you that API is uh, uh, application uh, program interface, and it's how libraries talk to programs. Uh, if you ask me, I'll tell you that uh, API is application programmer interface, uh, and it's how developers uh, communicate requirements with one another. Uh, I, th I think about API a little bit differently than a lot of people do, and I believe that API is really important and it has to work really well. Um, I've been a web developer since 96, uh, so that's almost as long as the web's been around. So I've watched uh, that particular uh, API group uh, uh, mature and find its way. And we've modeled um, uh, our future compatibility um, roadmap uh, at King's sort of around the way the web was built. One of the promises that I really want to make developers is if you write your code today, you can run it in 10 years. Um, and that's a, that's a big promise, but it's one that I'm comfortable making um, because I'm conservative in some ways. Um, and the, the other key thing with, uh, with API is that stuff has to be kind of uh, both intuitive and expressed at the right levels. And I, I draw a lot of my inspiration there from my time as a teenager writing software for 8-bit micros. Uh, uh, you know, I, I tell my developers a story uh, uh, about software development when I was a kid. It was, you go to the computer, you turn it on, you type in your program. When you're finished with the program, you turn the computer off the end. Uh, and what's incredible about that is that we're not booting up operating systems, and we're not getting compilers, and we're not writing these crazy tool chains and all that stuff. It, it was easier in some respects uh, then. And same thing with... Um, uh, with web development, once upon a time, you open up a text editor and you typed in some HTML and some JavaScript, you saved it in the directory of your web server, and bam, it just worked. And we didn't have all this complex tooling uh, and all these uh, other uh, things that we have in the back end now to make something happen at even the most basic level. So what I like to do is build my stuff so that the absolute core is at its absolute basic need. And that gives me a few things. It makes it possible to bring uh, developers into my ecosystem relatively cheaply. Uh, and at the same time, it allows me to operate with a wide variety of other common off the shelf components uh, that were built to interoperate with the, the, uh, you know, the nuts and bolts of the browsers themselves uh, in, in the first place. Um, and so those are the approaches that I've taken to building, you know, what I call our compute API that describes how the compute works. Um, and, and sort of some of the simplicity behind that. So it's actually realistically possible to uh, write a trivial distributed compute job with zero startup time and zero startup effort um, with a text editor and five lines of code. Now, that's not going to be a very fancy job, but the point is um, it's easy to get on board with what we're doing. Uh, unlike you know, some of our competitors, they require you to have compilation tool chains for every single kind of machine they might have happened in the wild, and then approve those processes, and then people deciding that they actually want to run your application, all this stuff before you've even got your first byte of compute done, you're you know, six months down the road. Or you've got a complex orchestration thing where you know, you've got uh, you know, two sysadmins in three days before they've actually brought your VMs online for you to even run your code in. Uh, uh, you know, I could have any of you guys write distributed code tonight. Uh, so and that's uh, so that's uh, how you know personally the way I look at both the compute and the web. 
landscape sort of through the lens of, you know, having grown up with all of this technology um, and having used it all at its various points in development and and seeing how, uh, how, how things are, are put together. That's how I've kind of built the stuff that we're doing at King's. Yeah, that's a very interesting problem and uh, honestly one that I hope to work on for the next uh, 10 to 20 years. Uh, because <laughs> not because it's going to take that uh, long to solve it on its basis, just that it's it's in, as an entire field. Um, so we have a few approaches that we use right now. Um, the most important approach is the idea in DCP that any worker can fail at any point in time for any reason, um, and that is a foundational uh, uh, sort of uh, axiom uh, built into how everything is designed. So. The schedule actually expects to have problems in worker land, which means that if a given piece of the job doesn't get run uh, immediately or exactly as expected, it's actually not a problem for the job. So um, depending on the characteristics of the job, there's a few ways that we can, we can handle that. Uh, one is we explicitly talk about the capabilities required um, of the worker on a, a job by job basis. It's when the job is declared. Um, we have uh, technology that will be rolling out shortly, uh, which is called an appliance, which is just like a job, except that it essentially has fixed source code. Um, and because it has fixed source code, it means that we can learn things about its behavior over time. Um, so we're going to be learning things like it, the job doesn't run well on machines that are constrained by X, Y, and Z. And then there's other externalities that also go into that. Uh, uh, so we're measuring uh, things like uh, wall clock time, CPU time, GPU time, and we're using st statistical methods to figure a lot of the stuff that when we run the workload, and we keep track of a given machine, how it performs on a given job, how it performs on other jobs. And then we also have uh, the machine owners, they can specify their use density um, for uh, their CPU and their GPU. They can say, hey, don't use all of my CPU uh, and you know only allocate my GPU at 30% or whatever. And our default is actually pretty conservative uh, on uh, mobile platforms. Um, and uh, then there's also you know things like uh, uh, credit wage exchange and, and uh, a few other, anyways. Uh, so long story short, we try to figure out the best place for work to run. If we find that work doesn't run well in a given place, we try not to run that work in that same place again. Um, and we'll reschedule pieces that don't come back when we expect them to come back. Um, I, I use some crypto signing techniques so that I don't have to keep track of a whole lot of this in my database. So I can actually safely send, you know, I give a type of work out to several workers and uh, let uh, this is, you know, depending on the job configuration and, and what the payment is and all this stuff. Uh, I can turn around and say, okay, I'm going to give this job to eight different workers and whichever guy comes back first gets paid or whichever guy comes back first, his answer gets taken and all of them get paid or I'm going to send it out to two workers and I'm going to make sure that they're sending me back the same answer and if they don't, then I'm going to use a tiebreaker and go to another one and so on and so forth. So I have a whole lot of... Uh, uh, detailed scheduling pieces that I can use to figure a lot of this stuff out. And then as Dan was saying, we've got the research group at Queens, uh, and they're working on a lot of really interesting problems, uh, including things like uh, predictive worker availability uh, and predicting uh, suitability for work on uh, different platforms and so on and so forth. So we've got some, some basic solutions right now, and we've got much more interesting solutions in the work uh, in the works. But the, the important thing is, you know, that the, the, the basic axiom at its core is that we expect failures and we expect problems. The entire system has been designed around that expectation, which means that I can build a robust network out of a non-robust components. Uh, and a lot of my thinking there comes back to, uh, you know, my time in telecom, where I had to build five nines systems uh, out of components that aren't five nines. Uh, I started building Sun HA clusters for the telecom industry in 99, I think, maybe 98. Uh, so I, I saw a lot of that, uh, you know, both in the field and on the planning diagram board. Uh, and all, all of those ideas have been 
drawn into DCP at its core at, at one level or another. Uh, honestly, from my perspective, not at all. Uh, they've got better social networks. They've got better applications, but they haven't actually pushed the bounds of their technology because they haven't addressed uh, the the real key issue, which is how can we run untrusted workload in untrusted environments? Um, and the untrusted workload, that is the Achilles heel of the entire industry that is doing this, that isn't doing it in JavaScript or some fundamentally similar uh, uh, environment and I got to tell you, from my perspective, JavaScript is the only answer. And the reason is, uh, no startup can actually replicate uh, a decade of work by four billion dollar companies. Uh, it doesn't matter how good you are, you, you cannot get that level of security uh, uh, work done. There will always be problems. Uh, you know, we've got the only solution, in my opinion, that can actually push this part of the industry forward. We need all of that stuff. We also need a developer community. Uh, we need a user community. We have to have all of these things go together. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, my time uh, with CommonJS for me was very eye opening in terms of watching things uh, progress into the new developer community. Um, and uh, those decisions, they, when they're carefully made and, and made correctly, they, they, they really do that, that, that snowball effect. So one of the things that I, I want to do with, uh, with uh, DCP is to actually um, bring in some of that legacy community and make their workload runnable everywhere. And, and uh, the other thing is I want to make it economically viable for them to do that. So one of the things uh, that's uh, on the roadmap in the not distant future is, you know, I want, uh, you know, uh, if Neil uh, comes up with a really good way of doing uh, parallel fast free transforms and writes that for DCP, uh, I'm assuming FFTs can be done in parallel. Dan's the master, not me. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a systems developer, uh, not a, uh, not a uh, abstract math guy. Uh, but anyways, uh, assuming they can be done in parallel, he could put that algorithm up on DCP in a library. Um, and uh, what we actually want to do is we're going to build in the royalty system uh, right into the library system for the workload. And the interesting thing is uh, we have a sort of unique uh, take on the piracy problem and on the payment problem um, because if uh, you know he's got his uh, algorithm registered with us, we can make sure that he gets paid when it's used by other applications on the network, which is something that's difficult to do these days. The other thing that's cool is that uh, DCP runs in places that our competitors can't possibly run. So let's imagine you're running a Photoshop clone in the browser, and one exists. But let's say you're running a Photoshop clone in the browser and you want to include ray tracing. Uh, where are you going to get the cores required to ray trace that stuff? Well, if you're in the browser already, it's a simple call to DCP. You just include our script, give us your inputs, wait for our results to come back, bam, you're integrated all the way right there. And that's one end of the DCP equation. Here's another intro DCP equation. Workers can be anywhere too. So let's say you have a big web property like, oh, I don't know, Google. Um, and inside your search page that people spend a lot of time on with multi-core computers, you add a little box that pulls down a slice and computes it and sends it back. That's actually worth more than ad revenue in some ways. Um, and that, we have that technology, it exists. Uh, you know, it's uh, half a dozen lines of code and all of a sudden you're uh, using the local compute uh, and depositing credits into your bank account at the other end. And it's secure uh, uh, via the, the crypto stack that we use. Um, the, uh, the, the, the people doing the work never have access to your funds, all that stuff's taken care of on the back end. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of these different things that, that we've thought about and we thought about how to actually get that wheel turning uh, because there won't be any demand if there's no workload. There won't be any workload if there's no demand. Uh, so the business wing of this company has really got me impressed uh, and it's why I'm really happy to be where I'm at these days. Uh, and we're, we're going to make that happen. Uh, and it's, it's going to get that going. 
the community. I can see them coming once we have uh, all of the pieces set up uh, where they can get their compute done fast. Uh, it's it's going to be it's going to be an interesting place, and you know I I recognize and and Dan recognizes that we have to have all of these places pieces in place. We can't just write a software stack and say look, because uh, I've written great software stacks and gone look, and that's where it's ended. Uh, so <laughs> it's not going to happen. Um, at a very high level, we're actually very close right now. Um, the the uh, Achilles heel that we have um, is that it's somewhat tricky right now to get uh, essentially large amounts of libraries uh, from the Node community at large, the JavaScript community at large, uh, into our work functions. However, um, that's not a difficult to solve problem. It's just a uh, a, a problem on our on our ladder that needs to be addressed in a slightly nicer API than we have right now. So we've had a working solution there for a couple of years. Um, we just haven't been paying too much attention to that because we've been working on interesting scheduling problems and uh, and so on and so forth. Like, um, the one thing that I would really like to solve uh, in the short term, and by short term I mean like this quarter. Uh, is to have a sort of uh, unified module system uh, that allows us to import a much wider variety of uh, external uh, functions from uh, the developer, from the existing developer communities, and have them run seamlessly and smoothly on DCP. So we've got uh, a wing right now of uh, guys that are looking at uh, the exact environment that our workers. Uh, uh, Emulate, and that's uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, what we call a window or worker uh, uh, scope, uh, and we're getting really good emulation on that, uh, which gives most common uh, uh, browser-oriented, in particular uh, JavaScript client libraries, a place to run. Uh, and actually, my my own personal research expertise in the JavaScript area is module systems. It's kind of ironic. That's the uh, the biggest piece that I still have to tackle. Is what. Uh, <laughs> Where my deep expertise is. <laughs> uh, the other thing we need to do, uh, again, in, in terms of bringing uh, more developers on board, is to get a better uh, and cleaner stack for importing foreign language workload. So our our AITF group, that's uh, Artificial Intelligence Task Force, they're doing quite a bit of work with um, Python these days. Um, and Python is the dominant language in that field right now, which is kind of too bad because it's actually much slower than JavaScript. Um, and I'm convinced that we can actually bring a lot of that workload over to native JavaScript if we get the right stuff done. The good thing is there's other people that believe this too. Um, so there is a platform called um, Pyodide uh, that is bringing um, a Python workload over into JavaScript. Uh, and there's also a platform called Inscriptum which uh, brings other uh, compiled languages into JavaScript. Remember I talked to you earlier about JavaScript is actually recognized as a compilation target now as opposed to just a language. Uh, so we have all of those things. What we need to do is we need to get some tooling up to make it easier for people to bring in sort of their legacy math libraries and so on and so forth and get into uh, the environment that we're offering them uh, and to make it a little bit more compelling uh, for people in those groups. Uh, neither of these things are actually really far off. Um, it's mostly a matter of uh, finishing stuff that uh, we've got uh, uh, on the go uh, in different groups uh, uh, already. Mobilization is going to be a really important step. And once we've got it easier to bring them on, uh, that's uh, easier. So luckily, we've actually got uh, an engagement person. I don't know if Dan told you about Topaz. She's fantastic, and she's got a... She's the one that runs our hackathons and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, been looking at some of that stuff. Uh, how uh, uh, I've been planning on doing some of this stuff in the not distant future is with the time honored uh, evangelization method uh, that was used very successfully uh, uh, with Mozilla. I worked with Mozilla quite closely uh, from two thousand and eight to two thousand and eleven on their JavaScript uh, engine. Uh, because uh, they were supporting me for a product I was writing at the time, uh, and I was uh, supporting them in terms of 
getting the uh, JavaScript 1.85 release out the door because I needed one, uh, and uh, 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 stick handling uh, Spark uh, changes uh, to the engine that they needed because uh, there was very few people in that particular community um, at the time. Uh, but evangelization for them worked really, really, really well. And I think it will work well for us. Now, one of the things that we've been doing is we've been uh, already casting this ball ahead of ourselves. So one of the things that's coming down the pipe <coughs> is WebGPU. Uh, WebGPU is the new emergent GPU standard on the web uh, that is way better than WebGL for many reasons. <coughs> And the major vendors are throwing uh, their support and their money into it. Uh, we have a working WebGL implementation on our backend work. So it's not released yet. Um, oh, sorry, WebGPU. Yeah, it's, it's confusing. They're almost the same letters, but they're completely different. Uh, WebGPU is going to allow is going to unlock a bunch of GPU functionality on this platform. It's going to make it easier to write certain types of GPU code, and that type of GPU code will actually work really well with DCP workers. Uh, the availability of GPUs will bring people. We're having a hard time even buying GPUs these days. Getting shared time on GPUs is going to uh, be irresistible for certain groups. And part of that same group is people that are interested in rendering. Uh, so for example, uh, I don't know if you know Blender, uh, uh, we that can render for Blender in parallel using DCP, uh, currently up and running in one of our research groups. Um, and those sorts of things, you know, these are like, uh, I call them like mini killer apps. That's the type of stuff that actually makes a platform. Um, and once our Blender stuff is ready for prime time and we start uh, uh, shouting about it from the mountains, that's going to bring people and so on and so forth. So we've got a strategy like this. Uh, you know, it's really, it's really key that our developer use strategy in this company is not to build products. Uh, because uh, I've always believed that product building builds small fortunes. Uh, and I, I, what I want to do is, is uh, build a new universe. Uh, and I'm interested in building out new ways of compute and getting the entire planet to, to see, to, uh, you know, to come to my, uh, to, to come to our plate. Uh, so, what we do instead is we build a platform and we've got people working on really amazing things to do with the platform. And we, and we bring those amazing things out going, look at this amazing thing. You can do it too. Here's the source code, get busy. And we're going to iterate on that. Uh, and I really think that once this becomes easy enough, and that's not in the distant future, uh, for people to get on board and start using it quickly. I mean, can you imagine that you're a web application developer and all of a sudden I said to you, oh, yes, your impossible to solve problem is solvable with one script line tag and a few lines of code to get what you need. Now, obviously, these are very specific needs, but the umbrella under those specific needs is really big. And the other thing, too, I think the world has been underestimating the need for parallel compute in this way. Uh, there's one thing that I've observed over the last lot of years of 30, oh my gosh, 39 years I've been using computers, uh, is that every time you put cool tools in the hands of nerds, they come up with amazing things that they can do with them. Uh, people don't come up with solutions right now that require a kilo core uh, to solve on the browser because those, can, those solutions are impossible to implement, but we're making them possible to implement. Uh, there is going to be, you know, uh, foundational shaking change possible with what we're doing right now. Uh, I really legitimately foresee new ways of thinking about new algorithms that get unlocked by what we're doing down here at King's. This is, it really is this big and this exciting. Uh, and if we can get this in front of the right people and have our stuff working the right way, uh, you know, the sky really is the limit.